Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, Studium Generale lecture. And I would also like to welcome the people who are watching us via the live stream. My name is Jaap Janssen and I am program maker at Studium Generale. And I'm joined tonight by Professor Ernst Koster. Thank you also for coming to Maastricht and welcome. And Professor Koster is going to talk about uh, yeah, something we all experience, um, maybe to a greater or lesser extent, namely having negative thoughts and being captivated by our thoughts and our brain. And um, yeah, we, have, we had a long period of COVID, so after this long period of COVID, we all um, were troubled with worries, I guess, more or less. And um, now we are seeing a, a horrific war taking place in Ukraine. And this also, yeah, worries me at least a lot. So it's, it's, it's a lot of emotions that we, that I get at least by seeing all those pictures of Ukraine. So, um, yeah, I guess the lecture is very... <laughs> very suitable, so to say, but uh, that's maybe uh, my, uh, my idea. And of course, we also have all kind, all kind of daily, daily worries that impact our, our brain and our thoughts. So what are the mechanisms behind these negative thoughts? And how do we manage those negative thoughts? That's something that Professor Costa will tell during the lecture of today. He is a professor of uh, clinical psychology at Ghent University. And he's doing research on the mechanisms behind anxiety and depression. Uh, he's also head of the psychopathology and effective neuroscience lab in Ghent. And he has his own practice for cognitive therapy. The lecture will take approximately one hour, and after the lecture, Professor Costa will be pleased to take your questions, and we will have half an hour for the Q&A, and we will try to end this session at 9.30. So please uh, give him a warm applause. Professor Costa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jaap. The, um, so many thanks for inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure to see live faces. Um, and indeed, I promised Jaap a little bit to talk about worrisome stuff. There's quite a lot of that going around these days. Um, what I didn't tell him is that I wanted to start talking about my wife. I wanted to talk, tell you a story, <laughs> uh, basically two stories about my wife. It's with her consent, so she knows. The, um, because what I want to show is just how remarkable these our thoughts can be. And so, there's two parts about my wife. I, there's many parts I don't understand, but there's two parts in particular that I want to uh, talk to you guys about. The first part is she's fearful of clowns. So how did this come about? When she was 13, way too young, um, she went to a sleepover with one of her uh, girlfriends at the time. Um, and she saw the movie It, right? So after that, I think for years in a row without her parents noticing, uh, she was extremely fearful of this clown. And of course, from a horror writer perspective, if you haven't seen the movie or read the book, it's amazing because this clown, only kids can see it. So parents cannot provide any reassurance. Um, so whatever her parents said, well, at first she didn't tell them, um, and they hardly noticed how sneakily she always tried to make sure that there were no clowns anywhere. Um, but the fun thing is that even though we're now sort of 20, 25 years later, um, she's still occasionally afraid of clowns. So sometimes when uh, I hear that she comes on the stairs a bit fast, then I know she again had the images of the clown again. She's a clinical psychologist herself, very good in treating anxiety disorders. But it's very interesting, this clown, um, it's a very vivid imagery. And she tells me that, um, you know, if she thinks about the clown, it 
it doesn't happen that much anymore, much to my displease, to be honest. But uh, when she thinks about that, uh, she even can sort of feel this little tingling sensation on her back, right? Are there is there anyone here el else afraid of clowns? Raise your hand if you think clowns are a bit nasty. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's very common. Um, but so that's interesting to me as someone who studies negative thinking. Then there's horses. So my wife also likes horses. Um, and there's a bit of a backstory there. So um, she was born with uh, spina bifida. You may or may not know that. It's a pretty severe condition. Um, and as a baby, she underwent massive surgery. So luckily, um, she was able to walk. Originally, she wasn't supposed to be able to walk, uh, but the doctors fixed that. Um, but she still can only walk for about 100 meters, uh, and then uh, she needs to use a wheelchair. But when her father passed away about five years ago, um, in her youth, she rode horses. She loved that, but then for some reason she stopped. Five years ago, she took up the hobby of riding horses back. And this really meant the world to her. So she was very proud. Uh, she, owned a, she owned a horse, bought a horse. Um, this very stubborn, uh, very heavy and idiotic, idiotic animal. I'm in the Netherlands now, so I can say this out loud. If I'm in Belgium and my wife hears me, she will kill me. Um, but anyway, the one day, so this horse is really stubborn. And so one day, the, she's riding the horse and he uh, starts jumping around. He got scared from something. And so she flies off. And with the amount of surgery, we very well know with the spina bifida background that if she falls on the wrong place, this will mean being in a wheelchair for life, right? Or other horrible things. But so this is really concerning, at least to me. She, on the other hand, doesn't seem to be all that concerned at all. The main thing she's concerned about is that I will start nagging about getting rid of the horses. But she has no problem in climbing back up. So this is where I need your help. Or, well, I won't make it too difficult today, but this is what's fascinating about this our negative, intrusive thinking. That she's more scared of this imaginary crazy clown with bad teeth compared to falling off a real horse and being in a wheelchair for life, right? So that's interesting. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the different elements of negative, repetitive thinking because there are quite a number of variations that we do, right? And what I want is for you to guys to take home what the different machineries are behind these different types of thinking um, in order to have a better idea on how to handle them. But as a disclaimer, uh, I hate sort of the five tips that are in the libella in COVID. We all got all these advices to be walking and to be fitnessing and to be doing all kinds of things for mental health. So I won't bother you with that. My idea is simply to give you some background in these type of thinking um, so that you can choose to do whatever you want to do with it but I hate people telling me I need to do these five things for my mental health. I will never do them. So, going back a little bit. So when bad things happen, say climate change, say Ukraine, say relationship stuff, or the thing that will happen to me when my wife finds out that I'm, I've been talking about her. No, that's not true. I have her informed consent on paper. Um, but anyway, stop it. Uh, when bad things happen, we reflect on them, right? And obviously, there are tremendous benefits for reflective thought. Huh? If we're able to reflect on past mistakes, we can learn by them, and it can help us to avoid these mistakes in the future, right? The, we know that basically we spend a large portion of our time the estimates are between 30 to 50% of our time, uh, engaged in thinking without being on a specific task. And this phenomenon we often 
referred to as mind wandering or daydreaming, the stuff I love to do when I'm traveling by train, looking outside the window. And it's interesting, there's been, the, there's been a bit of research on this, but actually this has been studied by Eric Klinger in the 60s and 70s for a long time, where the idea is that this type of reflection is really important for us, even when it's not very goal-oriented. And the idea that he has is pretty simple. Whenever we engage in a certain goal, say you want to study something, or say you want to be good at playing the piano, then this becomes a current concern of ours. Yeah? Uh, and that means that stimuli related to that will capture our attention, we will use all kinds of means to uh, make sure we reach this goal. And this also fuels our daydreaming. And basically what's interesting, the daydreaming that we do oftentimes is related to different goals that we have. So sometimes, say when you're obsessed with playing the piano, you might be thinking about playing piano, but oftentimes other goals that haven't been met yet pop up in your daydreaming. So Klinger thinks about this as a sort of a mental agenda, right? For the goals that you haven't been able to complete yet. And this happens to the extent until that goal is attained, right? You have this, you'll immediately notice this when you want to buy a certain car. All of a sudden you see it everywhere, even when you're not deliberately looking for it. Yeah? So daydreaming, contrary to what maybe your teachers have always told you, uh, has a really important function. And it helps us to reflect on things that are, on goals that are important to us. However, Killingsworth and Gilbert, a while back, did uh, a very uh, study that gained a lot of traction, where they uh, had a paper in science called A Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind. And what they did is they looked at all kinds of different activities that people do that ranged from being very engaging, like sp playing sports, to being more prone to mind wandering, daily chores, uh, sitting uh, at the laptop and those sort of things. And what they found is that uh, in relation to happiness, the less engaging something is, the more uh, annoying we find it right? The less happy it seems to make us feel. Whereas if we are engaged with our attention in something fully, then it feels much more pleasurable. So this is just one illustration of that this reflection part does not seem to be all that nice for our well-being. And this is also reflected in, of course, a lot of art, uh, with this one uh, being a very nice illustration of if we are too much in our heads, then things get heavy, right? Um, you made this in various different ways, and I really love them, uh, especially this one, where you can really feel the amount of energy that you lose by being in your head all the time. So even though we have this adaptive function, it's not so great. But again, make no mistakes, there are many upsides to thinking, to reflecting on the past, for prospective cognition, if I'm gonna give this talk, what will it look like, how will I do, will I be any, make any sense at all? Um, and also our ideas, our heads, of course, are the gateway to success, right? If I'm in my car back from this uh, talk, maybe I have this brilliant idea that will turn into a nature paper, right? So thinking, is really something, well, the chances are not high, I know, but our thinking is really, really important. But there's a price to pay. And the price that we pay is in the stickiness of some of our negative thinking. Uh, uh, and this idea of sticky thoughts that we're gonna develop a little bit. So today I'll be talking about three main culprits. Um, all of them belong to the class of what we refer to as repetitive negative thinking or preservative cognition, if you want. Um, and the main ones I'm going to talk about are worry, rumination, uh, and the worry and rumination we're all very familiar with, um, intrusions and obsessions, 
where some of us are familiar with that, others a little bit less. Um, but I'm going to talk about that also because I just find it fun to talk about. <laughs> That's a good reason as any. Um, so let's unpack, unpack these different things. So worry is something we're very familiar with, of course. Um, and how does that differentiate from the other things? And of course, there's a large degree of overlap between these different things. Worry is typically future-oriented and is related to all kinds of anxious, tension-provoking scenarios, right? What if I have to drive back and there's big road traffic in Brussels and I don't know my way? Oh boy, what if? Huh? Um, this provokes anxiety, tension, but it's important to note that oftentimes the anxiety and the tension, it's still pretty mild. It's nothing major. It's not that I'm now all in panicking mode because I need to, to drive through Brussels, but I'm thinking, what if? Oh boy. This is mildly arousing, so it does get your autonomous nervous system up, um, which is also why it's really oftentimes related also to sleep problems, or better said, sleep problems are oftentimes a consequence of being worried, right? What if I have this presentation tomorrow? What if I have this big test and I didn't prepare well enough? Interestingly, why do people do this? Because worry oftentimes disguises itself as thoughtful preparation, right? Uh, you have to do something important. You have to make sure that everything is safe. So it only makes sense to listen to these worries. If I'm gonna do that, but what if? If I'm going to book this holiday, what if COVID comes back, right? Although this seems like a, a very useful preparatory strategy, if this is excessive, which it is in a lot of people, then it starts to get in the way, right? It gets in the way of trying out different things, taking risk and all those sort of things. And so Tom Borkovec, things of, wor things of worry, as a bit of an avoidance strategy, where he says uh, many people do this because they're afraid they won't be able to handle a real catastrophe. So they just think and think and think and think, but probably overthink and don't take any real risks. If we then think about the function of worry, um, it's quite easy. Of course, we do this in order to avoid danger, right? So that makes a lot of sense. So apparently, very adaptive, but can take away a lot of joy. Then there's rumination. And this is maybe a term you're maybe less familiar with. Rumination is the term we refer to when we talk about the more depressogenic side of negative thought. And rumination has the, is the tendency to rehash, to think about why am I feeling in a certain way? Why do I feel this way? What has happened? What are the consequences of feeling this way? So oftentimes this is related to why questions. This can be, in the past they used to think it was only past oriented, but oftentimes it can be past or future oriented. And it mainly has to do with thinking about your own identity, your own happiness in a very energy draining way. Because if you ask this type of questions a lot, why am I not happy? Why, uh, why am I not as successful as my friends? What if this negative mood never will go away? Then you can sort of feel that it's very energy draining and it's also a very passive mode to be in. So oftentimes people can get into all kinds of rumination cycles. I will elaborate a bit on that later on. Um, again, this disguises itself a little bit as reflection, eh? if bad things happen to you, if you're in a relationship breakup, then of course you want to think about why did that happen to me, right? But oftentimes it can end up in a very uh, more, even more passive evaluative negative way um, where you're just constantly asking the same questions without advancing uh, a little bit, right? And we know that especially rumination is a very stable risk factor for depression, eating disorders, uh, all different types of psychopathology. 
And so here, if, the, if it's quite negative, then we could ask ourselves the question, well, what's the real function of this? Yeah, with worry, it's a bit more clear. But here, the functionality might be a little bit less. And going back to our statues, um, this is a thinking style that is not without risk in the sense that if you ever talk to someone who's depressed, you can feel that the rumination basically is taking the person to all kinds of places where it's really hard and where they're constantly confronted with their own failures, right? So this is not uh, something to, to do lightly because the effects are pretty extensive. So why ruminate? So there's trade views, just like there are for worry, where the idea is that individuals differ in their tendency to have sticky thoughts. Um, so for instance, Nolan Huxema argued that rumination is really the stable tendency to pay attention to your emotions, their causes and their consequences. Why am I feeling this way? Why am I not happy? Of course here, there's also state influences. So of course, if nasty things happen, then, and especially if you're really implicated in it, then you'll start to ruminate, of course, a bit more if you encounter stressful life events. And there's also all kind of contextual factors that can help to facilitate or reduce rumination. So if you're super busy, it will be a bit more difficult to ruminate. On the other hand, if you're in lockdown during COVID, it's a fantastic condition to engage in a whole lot of rumination. Why does this happen while well, I'm 18? Uh, so what about my student life, for instance? So we also did some theoretical work about the mechanisms underpinning rumination. And the basic idea that we have is if we encounter very annoying, difficult events, if we don't feel the way we want to feel, um, then starting to reflect is a normative process. It's basically a sensible process which most of us do. If your relationship just ended, you think about why that was. However, the problem becomes in the persistence of this type of negative thinking, where there the individual differences in your, in in your ability to stop this type of thinking is the key driving factor. And so I think we visually displayed it like this. Uh, this is a theory that we proposed, which is uh, which looks fancy, but it's actually super simple. So the idea is when negative things happen, whoop, yay, it works. Um, we start having self-reflective negative thoughts. So if I uh, in, I'm in the bathroom and I stumble my toe against the door, of course I'll think, oh my God, I'm such an idiot. How can I be so stupid, right? Then how you will deal with this is a little bit dependent both on your availability of attentional resources and whether you see these thoughts as low or high conflicting with your self-image, right? If you say, I'm such an idiot, I messed up this relationship, how could I have been so stupid? Uh, if this sort of matches with your self-esteem, then this will not trigger a lot of cognitive conflict and you will not start to disengage your attention away from this type of thing. You will start repeating this. And this inward focus, where there's prolonged rumination, we know that if you ruminate for longer, it gets more negative. And interestingly, although it's reflection that you're doing, it's associated with less emotional clarity. So there's been quite a bit of research on people who ruminate a lot versus who ruminate more. And if you ruminate more, actually your emotional clarity goes down because you're just rehashing the same stuff over and over. So if once I stumbled my toe and I've uh, started yelling at myself, but then I say, okay, I don't want to feel this way, then I can disengage my attention and start to engage in reappraisal. Yeah, I can start seeing things differently. I can distract myself. I can go watch some television or I can engage in mood repair, right? Um, if I keep Focusing inwards, on the other hand, then there's a whole host of research showing that if you ruminate a lot, 
And after that, or you have people, you manipulate people into ruminating. After that, you give them a task. They are become less good at problem solving, right? Their negative effect is higher, uh, and they start showing all kind of task impairments. Um, and oftentimes, if you do that a lot, then you can get trapped into vicious cycles because if you're not able to get out of a situation, say after the relationship breakup, after three weeks, you're still ruminating, how did I mess this up? How, what did I do wrong? Then of course you start ruminating about, why am I not dealing better? So this starts working into a vicious cycle. And especially also if people have depressive mood, so we know rumination helps a lot in becoming depressed. Uh, then we also know that your attentional control gets down a little bit. So that's a bit of theory behind why rumination is as sticky as it is. Okay, so in thinking about these things, especially worry and rumination, which is the type of thinking we encounter a lot, it's interesting to think about, instead of saying worry is wrong or rumination is wrong and not ruminating is great, we need to find ways in which these thinking styles can either be more or less constructive, right? Because I hate black and white thinking. So what are the features that make this type of thinking more or less uh, helpful? One of the things in an interesting book Todd Cashden wrote is about the uh, power of uh, feeling, feeling negative things. Um, and his idea is that the level of differentiation in different emotions determines to a large extent whether your thinking is helpful or unhelpful. And I'll give an example so you understand. If I'm again in this relationship breakup uh, and I think, oh, I feel horrible, uh, I feel so bad, then there's not so much I can do with that. On the other hand, if I'm more specific and I say I feel guilty because I wasn't enough at home, I didn't pay enough attention to my partner, so this is something I might want to do in the future. I feel lonely because it's COVID and I haven't seen anyone in a year. So this is a problem for me. If it's more differentiated, there's more stuff I can do, learn or take away based on my emotions. So differentiated is better than being very broad. The second distinction uh, made by Ed Watkins is the difference between Concrete versus very abstract thinking. Much of our thinking can be very abstract. If only my life was better, right? But this is sort of abstract thinking that doesn't land you into anything remotely actionable. So in many cases, it's more interesting to engage in more concrete, specific thinking. If you say, I, want, I don't want to feel this way. Okay, what exactly do you mean then? And so what exactly needs to change then, right? So prefer concrete is an important one. Then there's a host of interesting work done by uh, Ethan Cross at the University of Michigan, where they uh, looked at the effects of thinking about yourself in two different ways. Either in a very self-immersed way, where you say this negative thing happens and I see the movie clip with myself in it uh, in the first person fully reliving it versus I look at, my, I look at myself from a bit of a self-distanced way. Why did Ernst, why, why did he do like, why did he do this? Why did he make this bad decision, right? He did a host of studies showing that, well, and that's the obvious part, the amount of negative emotions is less when you do that in a self-distanced way. But interestingly, also your decision-making about yourself or the way you can reflect on past memories is much improved when you do that from a bit of a distanced perspective. Why is this maybe not so surprising? Of course, if you're in a bad relationship and you're a first person in this, it's all very complicated and messy. If you hear your best friend talk about a bad relationship, it's quite easy to say, well, this is wrong, that's wrong, and you should do this, right? So 
thinking about yourself from a bit of a distant way, not in a very avoidant way, but with some distance is helpful in making better decisions. And of course, uh, the last thing is if you think about yourself, you can sort of go for very evaluative thinking versus more mild or compassionate thinking. Um, the researcher is not really Gordon Ramsay, but it's a fantastic example on which things don't work, right? So in this whole kitchen nightmares things, uh, if you've ever seen that show, then he's this British chef cook who starts yelling at everyone. Um, and who basically, from the, be from the beginning, you would say, yeah, they'll meet him like a hero. They're going to be super happy he's there and to help them with their restaurant that is failing, right? Um, but of course, when the person enters the door, when he enters the door, he says, the food is horrible, your kitchen is a mess and you're ugly uh, and you're the most lousy chef I've ever met, which means that this makes for fantastic TV because no one will tr have themselves treat like that way. So they start putting up a fight and there's all kind of drama. And that's really great for television. But for your internal conversation, this may not be so fantastic. The, and many people talk to themselves in an extremely harsh manner that they only reserve for themselves. But there's a reason you don't talk to others like that because it's a horrible thing to do. Um, so why reserve that for yourself? There's no point. Another thing then, because we're still at the level of how can you be more constructive in your thinking? Um, of course, when you catch yourself being very often in all kind of worry or rumination loops that seem to spiral a little bit out of control, and there's some signals for that, being, for instance, not being able to sleep, feeling tensious all the time, uh, feeling anxious, but also feeling very energy drained. Huh? Then uh, my uh, Flemish colleague, Philippe Raas, has made a nice book saying how to avoid worrying and rumination. And he argues it's behavioral action that is crucial. Why does he argue for that? Because worry and rumination are very energy depleting, right? And because then you're feeling so low energetic, the rumination further feeds upon that. It says, I feel so miserable. Today I really don't want to do anything. Why, why am I never able to do anything? Everyone else is so being so successful, right? So it starts feeding on itself. So he says, the best way out of these spirals is actions. So then you can ask the question, any action? Well, the, basically the answer to that, any action, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> if you're really uh, in this horrible mood, then it really makes sense to do anything, to go do the dishes. Why? Because many times, if you're not really, really depressed, if you start doing things, you get a very small feedback si uh, signal saying, okay, whew, these dishes, I'm, not, I'm still not very happy, but I'm, I'm relieved these dishes are done. And then you see maybe the next thing, the vacuum cleaner that's been standing there all the time. You say, ah, fuck it, I'm gonna do that as well, right? So it changes your mindset just for a little bit. Right? So even very simple actions are really useful in that context. Be careful. You can kill the fun of these or this feedback signal that you get from these actions. You can also kill it by thinking. Right? So if you then say, huh, geez, yay, now I finished the dishes. Yay me. I'm such an idiot. Why did I even try to do it? Then, of course, any feedback signal that you would have that would be remotely positive, you will kill it and destroy it, which unfortunately is something that is a bit of a, a trap in the treatment of depression. So if you say to people, in order to be get out of your depression, it's really important to engage in behavior, it's very important to instruct them that you don't engage in the behavior to feel better. 
Why? Because, you know, during COVID, we all had to go walking, right? Because walking, that was great. I don't know who came up with that, but it was the thing to do. If you walk, and then uh, you walk for half an hour, and then you start looking at, oh, so do I now feel better? No, of course you won't feel better. Uh, you've just been walking. It's not nothing magical. So doing these things in order to feel better is not the right thing to look at because oftentimes these small actions are not that amazing with well-being immediately, but they give you a bit more energy, which help you to do more, which help you to be less stuck, right? Uh, and so that's important to take in, in, in mind, to take into consideration doing things in order to feel better is oftentimes not really the best motivation to do it. Of course, I said, is any behavior better than thinking? Of course, that's not always the case. If you can engage in things that you value, this will, of course, be most helpful. Why? Because it's then it's a protective thing against negative effects. So if during COVID, what happens in according to my thinking, uh, which could be very wrong, uh, but I wrote a, a stupid paper. Uh, at some point in Flanders, there were many uh, adults uh, and, and, and people who had jobs who said, why are these students doing so bad? They're so complaining about their well-being, but they don't have to care for four kids and uh, be at their job all the time, so why, what are they on about, right? where I wrote a paper uh, trying to explain that it's actually worse to not have any goals left. If you're, if you're doing six hours of online teaching, you don't want to do that. You don't want to study, it's horrible. And if you then have all your other goals being depleted, your social life, your activities, those sort of things, then, then there's not so much left. So this gives a lot of room for reflection and rumination and worry and those sort of things where it's much better if you still are obligated to go to a job, because if you don't, they fire you, but so that means you have to keep some goals online. But then, of course, it's important that the more valuable you find this goal, the better it protects you from uh, all kinds of stressors, right? Um, if I say, oh, it's so important for me to be a researcher and I'm publishing papers, then, you know, COVID might happen, but it won't affect me as much because I'm still quite focused on the thing that I value, right? So that's for sustainable effects, that's a more interesting one. But if you feel, if you have very low energy, that might be too much, too high of a bar. You might want to start with the dishes. Um, then I'm going to switch a little bit to intrusion and obsession. I'll come back with some broader points uh, about the other stuff later, uh, but I do want to talk about this also. So intrusions are unwanted thoughts, right? And obsessions, in the way that I talk about it, are things you, talk, you think about a lot against your will. So if you're thinking about uh, what's the, the six pack of Zac Efron, that's not, an obs that's not an intrusion. That's, you do that for fun, I think. I don't know. Um, why did I even say this? Anyway, back. The, this has the feature in, so it's related to worry, but the level of anxiety provokingness is much higher. So here, the intrusions are designed to really, really capture your attention and to say, Ooh, this is an alarm. Something's really, really wrong. So this is highly disturbing. And oftentimes, these intrusions take something that is very valuable to the person, right? We'll come back to that later on why that is. This elicits oftentimes active resistance. Eh? So if I say I'm on the phone with my mom and all of a sudden I think, geez, maybe I want to kill my mom. If I, <laughs> it, I'm not sure whether that was a sign of recognition. Uh, <laughs> shut up. Okay, yes, focus. Uh, in that anyway, the, if I have that thought and it's something I don't want to do, to be very clear, um, then 
I'm really shocked at why do I all, all of a sudden think this? What's wrong with me? I must be a horrible person. But this can take really many forms based on what the individual is like. And I think uh, intrusion obsessions do have a very strict internal logic, and I want you to uh, understand that a little bit. So the first question you can ask here is why do we experience, luckily this differs a bit between most of us, not so many intrusions, but we're all familiar to having all of a sudden you're on top of the uh, of a roll trap, I don't know, the escalator, uh, and then you think like, what if I fall off, right? We do have these uh, intrusions uh, quite frequently. The reason why we have it is based on opponent process theory by Wegener, who says every time we engage in a goal, especially in things we value, then this starts with an operating process. Which things do I need to complete the goal? What do I need to pay attention to? But less consciously, there's also a monitoring pro uh, uh, process where the level of goal attainment is being monitored and where also risks are being monitored. So that explains why if, say, I'm a young mother, which is difficult to imagine, I'll try, uh, and I have this young baby that I'm so desperately, uh, I want to take care of it so well, then I can have this thought about, but what if I hurt him? What if I'll strangle him, right? That's explained by this opponent process thought. You have these thoughts that especially when you're a little bit less busy with the operating process or you're being very tired, then this monitoring process can give rise to all kinds of thoughts that are the exact opposite of what you want. And this is not a sign that you're a horrible person. This is a sign actually most of the time that you really care about something. Then we know very well that there's a host of personality factors associated with OCD. So perfectionism and OCD are really good friends. Why? Because in my book, as a clinical psychologist, perfectionism, perfectionism is basically the same as looking for trouble. If I want my house to be perfectly clean, what do I need to do? I need to be looking for dirt all the time, right? So perfectionism and OCD work very well together. Being high in consensuousness, so having very high, especially moral standards. So if I do something wrong, I feel very morally uh, responsible for that. And obsessions and responsibility are big friends. And oftentimes insecurity is also involved in some level in the sense that it's less easy, the feeling of it's okay and I will be able to deal with it, it's less accessible, right? Um, so you have li lesser e reassurance to give yourself. Basically, these personality factors work together with all kinds of cognitive factors, with thinking styles, um, where the appraisal of the intrusion is one of the key things that's being important. So how do we go from an intrusion to an obsession? Oftentimes this happens because you say this intrusive thought, I just thought about killing my mother. What, what type of person am I? If I appraise a thought as being very important, being very relevant to myself and being very risky, then I will say to my brain, keep track of this thought. Make sure it doesn't pop up again, because otherwise you're really a horrible person. Which means your brain starts searching for occasions where it might pop up again, right? And you say, oh no, I had the thought again. Uh, so I must be a horrible person. The, um, so what happens is these, these intrusive thoughts get very high on the mental priority list. Um, you start monitoring for that more, and of course, people also go look for associations, right? So the, as a, a clinical psychologist, I see people with uh, obsessing, obsessions in all shapes and forms, uh, where someone says, uh, I work in a facility where there's young kids, what if I'm a pedophile? That would be bad, that would be very bad. The, and then your thinking starts to associate. So if you are then intimate with your partner, then the thinking says, yeah, but, but if you're a pedophile, then you would enjoy this less. And because you think about that, 
guess what, what happens to the intimacy? So your thought has just made itself almost happen, right? Because the intimacy, go, intimacy goes down and your, your OCD system concludes, see, you must be a pedophile because you no longer enjoy having being intimate with your partner. Um, and so it's really important to know that anxiety and attention are the big fuel for uh, this intrusive and obsessive thinking, where every time you pay attention to it, the more anxious it makes you, the bigger it gets, the more difficult it's to control. These thoughts, because they're so counter all your values, they demand action. Uh, they elicit, you need to do something because this is really bad. What are the typical strategies? There, there are a lot of mental strategies and I'm just giving you, I'm just gonna scratch the surface here. Uh, mental strategies are searching for evidence, right? So, okay, what if I'm a pedophile? I need to check this, what do I have as evidence? The problem with that is how do you make sure you're not a pedophile? Where do you feel that in your body? And then people want 100% certainty. But how can you be 100% certain of something you haven't done? It's very difficult scientifically. Um, many people engage in all kinds of thought control strategies, trying not to think about something which you know doesn't work. Uh, and behaviorally, there's oftentimes checking behavior uh, to making sure the door is locked 20 times just to be sure that you're not the one who will have your family killed in this stupid fire. Uh, there's reassurance seeking also from others that you oftentimes need. And there might be all kinds of rituals. Only if I do this 20 times, then I can be sure. The problem with all these behaviors is that they become a constant reminder of the intrusive thoughts and the obsessive thoughts. Uh, so initially they get the anxiety down, but you still need, you always need more and more of it. And this can really go like sort of a, uh, an oil stain in the sea, it can grow and grow and grow, right? So how to deal with that? Well, the key thing, and of course I'm being very short here, um, because there's this uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, it sort of exists in uh, a lot of different gradations, some being very, very difficult to treat. But the key thing always is, is to try to get the appraisal of the intrusion down and to have people understand the mechanics of this, how their thinking is projecting something that they cannot get out of, right? That was why I put on the strange fishnet. If you start looking for evidence that you're not a pedophile, you sort of swim, Oop. no, go back, yes, no, yes, that's stupid, okay. The, if you sort of swim in this uh, fishnet, that's what the OCD makes you. It has you swim into the uh, fish catching thing, a fuik in Dutch, uh, and you don't get out of it anymore. It just makes you work harder, uh, but you cannot get out. Um, so what you need to do is lower the significance of the thinking. So instead of saying, oh, this thought is really important, it tells something really important about me, you need to learn that this is part of your obsessive thinking that's really designed only for one reason, that's to take control of the steering wheel of your thinking, right? That's the big end game. The OCD always wants you to do what it wants. And if you don't, be careful because then something awful will happen. That's what its main argument is. Um, and so oftentimes the way I try to treat that is giving the analogy of uh, having bullies at school, right? If you know you're gonna go to school, you walk down the porch, and there's some people who've been bullying you, their game is to have an emotional response. So if you're anxious, they'll see it, they'll increase. If you're gonna be angry at them, they're gonna think it's funny as hell, they'll start doing it more. So what you wanna do with these bullies, even if you don't feel that already inside, is you wanna say, bite me, right? If they say, hey, look, Ernst, you really have a stupid head, then you say, well, thanks, that's really been very constructive. Um, see you later. And you wanna act as indifferent as possible, and you wanna give as little attention to them as possible. 
And that's actually the trick in order to try to reduce the significance of these uh, obsessive thoughts. But it's difficult because they're designed to make you tick, right? People need to learn to tolerate the discomfort that the thought tries to have them think and need to learn to inhibit the behavior. And just as an example, um, say for instance the mother who is dead scared that maybe I'm going to do something to my child. What if I strangle him or her? And so doesn't go to the bedroom at night because that's really risky and the, the partner always needs to be there. In the end, you want to expose them to that situation where they can stroke in the dark the kids and learning that the behavior doesn't come. It's all been uh, a poker play from the obsessive compulsive thoughts. But that's difficult, right? You can understand that. Okay, good. So some, some general remarks that might be clever, I don't know. Um, so thoughts are our key strength as human species. Um, and having a sticky mind is not a problem in itself, right? Most of the great scientists had a really sticky mind and a very narrow focus, and this worked out pretty well for them, right? But thinking can get in the way of having an enjoyable life uh, and of feeling well. Um, and there it's really helpful to try to unpack the thinking that's being constructive for you versus not so constructive. And to know some of the mechanics, the way it tries to, it's sort of temptation island oftentimes. Eh? These thoughts are there to help you. You're gonna help me avoid danger. Yeah, sure. But if I'm always on my room thinking about all the potential dangers that might hap happen socially, then maybe it's not being so helpful after all, right? And then you want to allow yourself experimenting with alternatives, which would be fun if it's behavioral, right? Other useful strategies being mild versus evaluative, being able to diffuse thoughts, so seeing thoughts uh, not as something really powerful, but seeing that they are just thoughts, right? Which can be more or less difficult depending on what type of thinking you're suffering from. Thoughts are of course not truths, they're just thoughts. Uh, and they might not be all that significant. Some portion of our thoughts, despite how clever you are, is really designed to throw you off your game. Choose action over thinking, eh? or make sure that you can translate your thinking into action. If you have all kind of worries, but you can translate that into something actionable, it's much more preferable than just entering in thinking. If I'm just being all sick about hearing all the news in Ukraine and feeling all worried about it, maybe I could think about what can I do, right? To think about actionable strategies. Purpose in life, goals in life are an interesting buffer um, to, to guard you a little bit against negative effects, but no perfect buffer, of course. Um, and know that if you live a valued life, negative emotions will be part of that. So if you're being insanely in love, then of course you risk losing that. So tolerating these negative emotions, it's not a bad thing in itself, right? That comes with failure and loss. Good, thanks for your attention. Uh, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, Ernst, for this great lecture and for offering some theoretical background about our worries and our, our rumination. If there are any questions, please raise your hand and I will come up running to you. And I will also, if there are questions in the chat, please, um, I will also bring them to the, to the speaker. There is a little bit of a delay, but I will try to get your question. Yes, in the back. Thank you very much. Um, can you tell us anything about the relation between ADHD and uh, intrusive thoughts? Is that also part of your <laughs> study field? 
do I know anything about that? The, um, well, so we sort of know, so the, it's an interesting question whether we know that the risk for psychopathology is a little bit higher in people with ADHD. There's all kinds of different reasons for that. Um, what we do know with worry, rumination, and that type of thinking is that if you have less attentional control, you're a little bit more prone to engage in that type of thinking. Um, and so ADHD being, of course, a condition where your inhibition might be a little bit less. Um, so in that sense, we sort of know that that might be related to why um, there's a, har a larger chance for anxiety and depression in this population. Uh, it's not the only route, because of course, with impulsivity, other things can come uh, that might be a risk for anxiety or depression. But the, um, so there's some shared mechanisms uh, in relation to the risk for this type of ruminative thinking and worrisome thinking and ADHD. Is that sort of an answer? Yeah, or? It's a C minus. <laughs> Not really, yes? My question wasn't very pointed, so thank you. <laughs> okay, if you can come up with a more pointed one, I can see whether I have more pointed answers. But Any other questions? Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> um, when talking about unconstructive versus constructive thought, you talked about the level of emotional differentiation, which is higher in constructive thought. And I was wondering if you could illustrate that or explain more in detail what you mean with uh, the level of emotional differentiation. Yes. The, so the, I think that's a, that's a good question. Eh? So I went on that very rapidly. But the, what I mean with if you are able to, the, you have many emotions that we can feel that are very broad, right? Say you feel upset or annoyed or uh, uh, sad or whatever. If you can differentiate a little bit better what the sadness is about or whether it's sadness but related to some level of disappointment in yourself, in your own actions and sort of being maybe also disappointed in how someone reacted to it, you can start thinking in more detailed manners about what do I want, what do I need, what can I do to do this better the next time, right? So that's what I mean with the, the emotion differentiation. Does that make sense? Great. Yes, I see a hand over there. Um, I've been learning about acceptance and commitment therapy recently, and I was wondering whether you think it's a good um, way to uh, counter these thoughts, these negative thoughts? Yeah. The, so I think the, um, the acceptance and commitment therapy is, is very interesting. Eh? The, um, I think the um, making sure that you don't fall together with your own thinking is really important, especially when it, it comes to very negative thoughts about yourself, being able to, to make sure that they don't uh, determine everything you do is very important. Um, I do think in some contexts it's m less easy to accept certain thoughts, right? Uh, in the context of, say, the, the OCD, um, it's getting people to diffuse from this thinking is quite hard. Eh? So I, I know in, in, in ACT sometimes they make then these songs, in my example of being a pedophile, they make the, the happy pedophile song or whatever, um, which is a bit weird on its own. Um, and sometimes it's really not that easy to diffuse so rapidly. So then it's really sometimes important to learn how to do that very stepwise. But I think there's a lot, in lot of interesting ideas in ACT. Yes? I think there was a question there, and then there I see someone in the back. I will go first to the back. Um, what would you say to uh, the idea of suppressing negative thoughts? Does that work or does it come yeah. to the surface? So that's interesting. So there's, of course, a ton of work on thought suppression, um, where the idea, the, the, the Wakener paradigms with the white bear, um, it's very clear. If you say, well, you, you need to suppress thoughts about thinking of a white bear, um, then 
they will pop up more frequently. Um, if you start looking a bit more critically at that literature, um, okay, the, then uh, what you see is that the, the, the level of frequency not in all studies goes up so much. Um, in the context of OCD, it's really important that mainly it's the appraisal of the thought that tends to become more negative. So in my example of if I'm a young mother and I have this thought of what if I, if I hurt this kid, um, if I have this once, then I think, oh my God, what is this? If I have this a second time, I think like, oh boy, now I'm thinking this again, something must be really wrong with me. So I think the, the thought suppression as a strategy is typically not the best strategy. Um, also, for instance, in many treatments, I, I tell people the goal cannot be to not have any intrusive thoughts anymore. Why? Because if you say, I cannot have any intrusive thoughts anymore, then you say to your head, oh, be very cautious if something is related to that, whether something pops up. And so you'll uh, increase the likelihood of those thoughts popping up. So the idea is intrusive thoughts, you have not so much to say about it, um, but it's in the aftermath that you can do something. Um, and then the idea is that if you think less and less and less about this topic, just like your French from high school, it will sort of uh, become less accessible unless you go for five days into France and then all of a sudden you find the words again. But in OCD land, you want this topic to sort of sink down in memory. Was there a question over here somewhere? Oh, over there. How large is the genetic factor for a person to be prone to getting stuck in reminiscence and uh, intrusive thoughts? Yeah. The how large is that exactly? I don't know. I think the heritability estimates for, say, uh, depression or OCD um, are sort of 40%, the, um, where there's, there's definitely uh, an influence of, of many parental factors, uh, the, the, the way people are being raised with cultural norms. Um, and people can sometimes be really raised with better safe than sorry, um, but there's definitely also quite a large genetic component. Any more questions? Yes. Um, so I was <laughs> wondering about the kind of the difference between intrusive thoughts and worry, because both of them seem to be pointed at what if questions. Yes. Uh, intrusive thoughts seem a bit more severe, but like, how do you distinguish between those? Yeah, that's a great question. So. To me, there's not a very sharp distinction between one is perfectly there and one is perfectly there. Both act on this what if, but the, 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 the big difference is with the amount of resistance the thought is being met in the sense that if I think, say my, my kids need to go to school and there's this busy crossing, um, a very related thought is, oh, what? Will they be safe? Are they old enough to cross the street? What if someone is, is driving very rapidly? Maybe I should do something, right? It's, it's threatening. It's what if something happens, but it's still not very engaging in the sense that I say, I need to act now immediately. This is really bad. Intrusive thoughts often are implicate yourself more with responsibility. Uh, are more difficult to tolerate and so are much more cross your core values, right? And one of the interesting thing, of course, is, and that's where they, they play together, um, is once you've thought of something, you're also responsible, right? So that's a very stupid mechanism, but it's, it's a fun one because, you know, if you now say, I go to sleep, um, 
but yeah, this oven, the electricity behind it, it's really not that great. Uh, so if anything happens, uh, let's hope nothing happens. But because you've now thought of this, if something would occur, you could have prevented it. And that's a trick that, that in OCD land is a very important one. The fact that you, that I thought about, hey, this is a dangerous crossing. Um, so if now something happens to my kids there, because I said, well, no problem, let's go, then I'm partly responsible. So that's something that's very difficult for people with, with OCD. But there's not a real, this one is this, and this one is, is totally different. They act on the same platform. Can I ask a question? Yes. So, <laughs> so why is my wife not fe more fearful for her horses? Who can help me out? Yes. She understands horses. Can you explain that to me? I will try. Um, horses are very keen in uh, feeling and interpreting uh, the human who's, uh, who's there. Mm -hmm. They're also very receptive to emotions and they, as a herd, they want to protect the members of the herd. And probably, I think your wife, also because of her physical uh, uh, ailment, has a tender spot with this stubborn uh, horse. And, um, and I also assume that your wife also has a mind of her own. You already <laughs> said so much. Yes. So, um, and uh, I think there's a, uh, there's a, um, a feeling of confidence on both sides. And she's in control and the horse is in control and they share that. Mm -hmm. And you are not in control and you hate it. Yes. It's, I think it's, a f uh, I love the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Many of that rings true in my mind. The, and it's, it's very interesting because indeed for her, driving these horses is such an important goal uh, of feeling alive that she also has a very clear focus. And with focus comes confidence and the horse also feels that. The, so indeed she has more control over this situation than I do. Uh, and I have nothing to say, so yeah. There you go. Thanks, that's a great answer. You had a question here. Yeah. Um, you talked about distancing yourself from uh, certain situations which makes you able to reflect better on those, mm -hmm. but would that not also make it harder to actually process the feelings you are experiencing in that moment? Right, so in the Ethan Cross, um, experiments so he tries very hard to not make it a sort of very emotional detached distance so he really asks to observe what the person is feeling and to, to sort of also be quite close to that um, without really being fully in it the, but you're definitely right there's some part of where you have a bit more distance from the emotions that maybe you might be less uh, your, your emotional experience might be a little bit less vivid. On the other hand, less vividness might come sometimes handy. So the, the, my mother-in-law, who had to suffer the loss of my uh, father-in-law, uh, she was also a behavior therapist. And we had a conversation about doing therapy with people who are stuck in uh, pathological grief, right? And she says, uh, after the death of her husband, she said, it's so interesting. I know I helped a lot of people with pathological grief. And I realize now that I didn't even know one tenth of the experience. But I'm really sure I helped those people because I still get cards in the mail by Christmas and those sort of things. So maybe sometimes also being fully immersed in the emotion is, is might not be the most helpful way in order to have perspective and to know what to do. So I thought that was a good example. Uh, anyway. Yes? yes. Yeah. First, I want to thank you for a very interesting and, and beautiful lecture. Um, the thing you, you talk 
in your lecture on cognitions and on emotions. And there used to be a professor called Schachter, and he had his uh, two-factor theory. And he turned things around. He said, first, your body is uh -huh. giving a signal, and then your mind starts scrambling and saying, hey, what, what is happening? For instance, if, if you have a, a, a brain ailment and you, you, know, you can't stand up right and you feel that you're falling, it's the falling and then the analysis and the emotion and the cognition. How do you think about that theory? Yeah. The, so if you're the, so of course I know Schechter. Um, I think in many ways, behavior is very, very important in how you feel and think about things. So the, that's, for instance, in anxiety with regard to um, treatment. I mean, if you are able to approach something uh, instead of saying, oh, this is scary, then this, of course, gives a very uh, lively signal to your, both to your body as well as to your mind that things are a bit more safe. The, so in that sense, the behavior is really, really important. Also in the context of depression, so there's much more work on the thinking part than sometimes on the behavioral part in depression. But we do know that, for instance, behavioral activation as is really key, key, key to the treatment, to the successful treatment of depression. Um, so making sure that avoidance behavior also there, because there's a lot of avoidance behavior. Uh, oftentimes that's, that's one of the first parts to tackle before the thinking can start to change, right? If you don't do anything all day long, then your reflective thoughts have a field day uh, in telling yourself you're not doing that great. So oftentimes, the, the way I, I work is sometimes behavior first, and that will, is one of the most powerful things to move the cognition around. So it, it, I definitely don't want to argue for the primacy of cognition uh, in this context. I have a question is I assume that everyone has a negative thoughts and uh, will be the more um, optimistic person will have less ne negative thoughts than the pers pessimistic person and another question is um, it's very interesting and helpful lecture for me at least and I feel um, if everyone has negative thoughts, maybe yeah, it's very good that I'm here to listen the concepts, and then I can awareness. Uh, the I can aware of okay, it's fine to have negative thoughts, then maybe accept it. And you also mentioned the power of the negative thoughts. So I want to ask then how we can make use of the power of the negative thoughts and then also avoid the tricky part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, first off, I'm very glad you find it helpful. The, and I think it's important to share about our negative thoughts because the more we keep them hidden, the more powerful they can sometimes become. So I think that's, that's a really lovely remark. Um, are there individual differences between people having more or less the positive or negative thoughts? Yes. Um, but I personally, because there's there's a lot of there's the whole positive psychology movement where you know every day you need to uh, say or write about three things you experienced and uh, think a lot of happy thoughts. I'm not such a huge fan of this. I'm I'm a bit more of a I'm a, I'm a larger fan of the trying to to work, trying to see no rip right there, trying to make sure your thinking is more or less constructive, where also, you know, if you do something with a purpose, or if you do, if I do, if I give this talk, I risk being an idiot, right? Or being made fun of, or saying stupid things, right? The fact that you say, I'm gonna do these valued things anyway, and I take on board all these negative things that may come along with it, then all of a sudden these negative things don't become as much as an enemy anymore, right? So 
I'm not a big believer in this American style. Uh, yeah, everything's great, awesome, fantastic, and, and say happy things to yourself all the time. That doesn't mean that you need to, you know, that your internal voice needs to sound like verbal abuse. That's something different altogether, right? So what you want to do is find a way in which you can motivate yourself a little bit. Say if I would now have given a talk and I'm really not happy about it, then I want to be able to find excuses for myself. I had been in the car for, for two hours and, and then we had this super nice dinner and so I drank too much. So I want to give myself some helpful thoughts in still trying to get back up and do it again because it's something I value, right? The, so I'm not such a big believer in, in the idea that if you just say all, all positive or think all positive things that that's the, the perfect way to do life, right? I think it's much more helpful to be focused on things that you value, on your purpose, and take on board many of the insecurities that come with that. Because the higher you'll fly, the more likely it is that you'll make stupid mistakes. So you have to sort of take those ones on board. And you have to tolerate some of the, the nastiness that comes with that. Not sure whether that was an answer, but okay. I tried. I, th I guess we have to uh, wrap up, up now. And you didn't say any stupid things at all. So it was <laughs> not at all. So it was very, very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you again for this uh, very interesting lecture. One applause, please. Yeah. Thanks. I would like to mention two of our upcoming events. Tomorrow we have an extra lecture about Ukraine. It's by Robert Seri. He's uh, the former ambassador to the Ukraine, the first ambassador of the Netherlands. And on the 5th of April we have the lecture License to Sell Arms to Kill. And that's about arms trade and its dealers. So please come to Studentkanale next time. Thank you all for coming.